Welcome back to the podcast, Washed Up Walk-Ons fans. Today, it might be solo for a bit. Me and my guy, I'm going to introduce him in a second. Drake, Kevin, they're not here. I think Kevin's in like Pittsburgh. Drake is probably at Jiu-Jitsu. He's going to hop in here in a second, I believe, or not. It might just be me and my guy, Jason, the guest on the show today, Jason Manson, former Iowa quarterback, receiver, running back. It says you had a, r- a couple rushing attempts. You had a couple of receptions. I think the most. I, I, I don't think it was any handoffs in there. I and I think uh, I think we're gonna get into it eventually. But the the most maybe what you're most remembered for and and what we joked about on uh, on the day that I met you two weeks ago was the day that you got to start instead of Drew Tate against Syracuse. But, but we will get there. Thank you so much, Jason, for coming on the show. No, I appreciate it, Tyler. Thanks for having me. I, uh, for those listening, I met Jason two weeks ago at the, uh, Polk County iClub golf outing, uh, someplace that Jason and I, neither of us are supposed to be, (laughs) I would say if you looked at our golf game and, uh, man, you weren't even supposed to be there. You were a fill in for, for our guy, Ben Hanson. Yeah. And and Ben was, Ben was on call. He was kind of, he was doing some work, but, um, I mean, bro, you're, what I did not include in the intro is you are the brand new director of player development for the Iowa Hawkeyes and you, your last month has been crazy. I'm sure. What's that been like the transition? It is, uh, it's an exciting time. Uh, but it has been, has been crazy, man. I kind of got in and kind of got thrown to the wolves Mm -hmm. (laughs) and, uh, been trying to figure out the processes and things like that. Nuances of the job getting reacclimated to the school and seeing all the new stuff that that has been built and meeting some old faces and and meeting some new faces but getting acclimated to the role nonetheless that's <clears throat> that's fun. What, it's, it's got to be fun. wild to come back 15 years later right yeah, yeah it's i mean different. when's the last time you were back in iowa city before you got the job before that uh 2018 okay i i, I last couple years i've been applying at a couple of different jobs that have been opening up here okay um but 2018 was the last time i was back since 2006 okay since yeah. 2006 wow so it was it was 12 years yeah that, damn that's crazy yeah um well you miss me and drake and kevin we played from we played from 13 to 17 gotcha. we were still in town in 18 trying to train for the pro day something that we also talked about a couple a couple weeks ago yeah. uh something that all four of us have in common. None of us got a call from the NFL. <laughs> um, but you mentioned, you, you mentioned, you mentioned that day that you, you did play in, you did play after college. What was, what did that look like? And, and I'm going to go way back to how you found Iowa and all that too, but what did your, what did your post Iowa career look like? What, obviously you still had a, an itch for the game, wanted to extend that out as much as you could. What was that like? Yeah, so immediately after college, it was the it was the chase the NFL deal, found an agent and working out, trying to make sure I was ready for a call that never happened. Yep. And you were hey, I, you were I looked up some pictures, man. You were bodied up. You were bodied up back then. <laughs> I was too heavy. I was still I think I was too heavy at that time, man. I was like 205. I probably should have been around like 195-ish, probably. I don't know. How tall? Year, I was 205. I How know. tall are you? 5'11". Oh, okay. Maybe. I used, okay. Lie, I used to lie. I said I was 6'1". Okay. Yeah, you might have been a little <laughs> – you might have been riding that line of thickness then, maybe a little bit. <laughs> no doubt. No, I definitely was. I haven't been able to uh, get it off since. Hey, we, so, talked, about, we talked about that I'm too. Trying, I'm, I'm going to sign up for one of your programs, man. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, uh, but no, late that summer – so I graduated. I graduated in spring of 06. Mm-hmm. The fall of 06 um, was my – fifth year so my senior my red shirt senior year or whatever right. you want to call it yeah of eligibility my last year of eligibility played that out and then that whole spring was kind of waiting for something to happen preparing for draft or pro day and mm-hmm. the nfl shot nothing and then the summer that summer of 07 i think it was june i got a call to come join some arena indoor football league mm-hmm. 
and it was a a, a, a team out in uh, St. Louis, okay. uh, River, the River City Rage. So I was out there for maybe six weeks. Okay. And got a chance to play a little quarterback and receiver in, in the indoor league. And that was that was probably the the, the longest I stayed. The following yeah. year, in the winter of 08, I played like two games in Massachusetts for a team called the New England Surge. Okay. I got concussed the first game. The second oh. game, I was still woozy, and I hung up the cleats after that. That was it? That was it? <laughs> Man. Yeah, and then, and was- then the, crazy, the crazy thing is like 20, what was it, 2015 maybe? Yeah. I played semi-pro. Did you really? Uh, I was coaching at a high school in Hartford called Capital Prep. And then one of the, my coaches on the staff was playing semi-pro. He kind of convinced me to do it. And oh man, uh, my uncle was like the head coach, and he wanted to play, wanted me to play for a long time, and I wouldn't do it. So I just said, at that point, let me just do it. Let me Hop back in the game. Yeah. Was that, was that, that, that for a lot of people that might not be smart for the body? Nah, it, it probably it, it's, at my position I was fine, but right other positions I wouldn't recommend it. Yeah. <laughs> What was the what was the psyche like uh in those first couple years trying to figure out like do I try to continue to play this game or what do I do for a job? How do I start real life? Uh like what was your thoughts about I know we talked about you you uh I think pretty soon out of college you had your first kid. And okay. so it was like what what was was that a hard time to figure stuff out? Yeah, so I got done, like I said, the fall of 06 was the last season I played college. Yep. And then after that, it was kind of like trying to make something of a professional career in sports was like the goal. You were holding on to it. Holding on to that. Holding on. And I listened to your podcast today and it was like similar stuff, man. You, you, you're trying to figure out what is the next step. Yeah. And I was I was stuck, man. I was stuck trying to make it, trying to figure it out how I was, how I was going to make it. And then my wife... <clears throat> Who was my girlfriend at the time, and, and we had our first our first bo- child was gonna be born in the spring of 08. We got into a huge argument, and uh, she broke our TV, like threw the remote at the TV. I was I was laying on the couch one time. She wanted you to get a job, huh? And she wanted me to go to work, man. Yep. And so I was trying to figure out how to work and still try to play football and all that type of stuff. So I was yep. working at Verizon Wireless. So yep. I got a full time job working at Verizon. I love it. And then I was still trying to do the semi-pro. And then I was coaching at the same time. So I was at Western Connecticut State University yeah. coaching receivers. So the schedule was crazy. I, so I you, were, you were running around all over the place. I was all over the place. I was driving like 40 minutes to work to, to go coach at WestCon. Then then I was driving like an hour back to go to work for Verizon. Oh, my and then God. Twice yeah. a week, I was driving to Worcester, Massachusetts, which was like an hour and 20 minutes away, <laughs> trying to, you know, trying to do all that. So the concussion helped, and I, it helped me hang up those yeah. cleats for that indoor stuff. And then um, coach, the coaching thing kind of kept, uh, kept me into it. We got a guy that knows quite a bit about concussions uh, as Drake just Hey, joined. fellas, CTE City, join in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> I don't Drake, think yeah. had that. Yeah, I don't – yeah, you, Jason probably didn't have as many uh, concussions as you did, Drake, but uh, welcome to the podcast, buddy. H- how, how's your day going? Dude, that was one of the hardest days of my entire life. Uh, the humidity is insane in Arizona right now, and I just got my balls absolutely kicked off. So uh, that's how my day's going. But, Jason, I hope yours is going a lot better, pal. It's good to meet you. Good to be back, man, for sure. Yeah. Um, Drake, we're just talking about we're, – we're kind of talking about Jason coming out of, uh, coming out of his career and, and then trying to figure out how to do adulting. Uh, it's the worst thing in the entire world, isn't it? it it's tough, man. It's tough, had, but, and so ahead. now, and there's a lot in between that I'd love to hit on too, but now 15 years later, I mean, I guess 13 years later, did you ever think that you would be working for the head man KF? Is that wild to you? It is wild. <laughs> it was a goal though. It was a goal. It, it was always when the goal. I, when I started coaching, it was a goal to come back. Okay. So about like 2000 and 2000 in 2009, I'm sorry, the fall, the, the summer fall of 2008, I went to a place called Milford Academy. 
Mm-hmm. And Coach O'Keefe, who's now the quarterback coach here, he was the offensive coordinator when I was in college. Mm-hmm. Um, but he helped me get that job at Milford Academy. And at the time, there was another Iowa grad. He was the D coordinator. His name is uh, Derek Davidson. He was the DC. I was the OC. And, and around that time, I was like, man, we, you know, I, I it was probably my greatest experience as coaching where I had to, like, really, like, do everything, learn it all, how to manage kids, how to prepare schedules, practice schedules, uh, the whole gamut, um, put things in perspective. And then after doing that, it was like a goal at that point to come back to Iowa and, and potentially be a coach over there. So you, I was chasing it for a while. Yeah, it, it's it's so it's awesome now to see it work out, right? Because it it doesn't work out for everybody, you know. Right. And right. you know, life takes people in different directions. Was the goal to always make coaching your work, or did you have you know you're still in college, still going to class? Did you have other ideas of what you were going to do in life? I think um, I, I I still was trying to figure it out. Okay, and a lot of times during my experience here being a backup quarterback, helping young quarterbacks coming in, learn the system and things like that, helping receivers, running yeah. back, whoever the case was, understand the offensive system and and being in that leadership position as a quarterback. A lot of people, former players and parents, um, you know, they always say, hey, you, you make a great coach. You should go into coaching. You should go into coaching. So it was kind of like a, a natural transition that gave me the football fix, Mm -hmm. but then more gratification as I, as I started coaching at different places, more gratification because you start to have an impact on the guys that you work with and they, they, they take certain things, but watching them grow and learn and take what you're teaching them and, and, and apply it on the field and off the field. Um, that's where I started to get some gratification in it and, and, and it kind of just stuck. The, the role that you're in now sounds pretty damn good, pretty damn set up for, for that right there is the on the field, off the field stuff, especially right. with the young guys. Cause you're, you're mostly focused almost hundred percent with the freshmen, right? Um, yeah. I think I'm, 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 I feel like a freshman. <laughs> you, you probably feel, do feel like a freshman feel, right now. I feel like, a what's freshman? it feel like being on the other side though? Like I've always wondered what it feels like to sit in those coaches meetings and you know, be behind the scenes because all that shit gets said that the players never get to hear. And I just feel feel like it would be so interesting to be a fly on the wall. Yeah, definitely. It's it's kind of like it's kind of surreal sometimes. And then, and then it puts things in perspective. Uh because I, I can go back and think like, man, I wonder what coaches were thinking. I wonder why they made us do certain things. And now I get to see why the why behind it. Um mm-hmm. and sometimes what they're thinking. And then at the flip side, on the same time, I'm trying to make sure that I understand things and can put things in perspective for the kids that I'm working for now. So yeah, I'm kind of like the middle guy. I'm in between. The, the D one football program, it, it can't just be at Iowa. Uh, it's, it's, it's probably everywhere. It's so fast paced. And I don't think that there, I mean, there's other areas of work and life that, that are that quick, but the rate at which things happen and that work gets done and that you're on to the next thing, on to the next thing, on to the next thing within even just a day or a week or this phase of the year, right? Uh, at the division one level of sports is nuts. And yeah. people people don't always understand that kind of stuff. And you are, you probably, it's funny, you probably do feel like freshman year walking in and now you have to figure out classes as an 18 year old and you have to figure out campus and you have to go to practice and is it a similar feeling? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, in fact, my I want to say my second day here, I went on the campus tour with the freshmen. <laughs> yeah, I love they're, it. They're in the Summer Bridge program, and part of the program was to give them the campus tour, get them acclimated. Yep. So I, I took the CAN bus. Uh, we went down to the IMU. So yep. we just circled, circled the whole campus again just so I can see some of the things that are new. Most of the things are still the same. They yeah. Just, they, they, they renovated it. The library looks totally different on the inside from when I was there. I wouldn't know, but yeah, no, it's, it's crazy. <laughs> I didn't go to the library. <laughs> uh, you, yeah, you know, man, I no, want you to realize that the Big Ten stats and stuff. Some of y'all are in the library. Oh, no. This not. dude, Kluver, this dude, Kluver, Jason, you got to understand. If you would have been at your position and been monitoring Kluver's uh, workload in college, you would have been very disappointed in his effort. 
<laughs> I was just going to ask when you guys, you know, like in 2005, in 2006, did you guys have somebody in this role? Was it a role on the, on the staff or was there anyone that like their job was something else, but they also kind of handled this. Cause I know when we walked into the doors, uh, Chick Ejiazi was the guy. And right. I don't know how long he had been there doing that, but I feel like he might've been the actual first one with that specific role. Um, you- I don't know if we had anybody with a specific role. I think we had um, a couple different guys. So we had like Derv. I don't know if Derv was around when you were around, but Derv was like, nope. he was one of the guys we kind of went to when we needed things. Okay. Um, uh unofficially i think john streif might have been another guy we kind of just if we needed something help figuring something out he'd help he's an absolute legend after i broke my leg he showed up to the hospital with the newspaper just because he thought i might need something to read he was like hey i just really wanted to check on you i was worried about you here's the newspaper he might have even brought me something to eat like probably that guy did. is an absolute legend. Probably did. Probably, probably add some candy to the package. <laughs> I feel like everybody from, you know, the last 20 years of Iowa football has a John Streif story. Absolutely. Interestingly yeah. enough, I don't. I never, like, I would always hear these stories, and I nev- I've never actually talked to John or met him. Crazy. But, but like, everybody I mean, else. I'm, in the- when I was there, too, he was also the one that gave us our, uh, our meal stipend okay. on game days. So when mm. we come down for breakfast, we had to sign off for it. Yep. And he just give you an envelope, get you 10 bucks for lunch or whatever. Yep. It was uh, legibly pleased. That was his, his saying. Legibly pleased. I had to write your name legibly. <laughs> but, uh, That's a good feeling too, getting that 10 bucks, huh? It was it was huge at the time. Now they oh. got black cards and all types of stuff. So I'm like, some things have changed that I'm, I'm, I'm learning now. What do, you, what do you think? What do you think about that, man? How different is black card compared to what, what you guys were on? I think they got a lot more options. You, <laughs> we got you. Uh, we got like ten bucks, maybe fifteen, if I remember correct. And we got fifteen, I think, right, Drake? It was like, it was like Domino's. All right, let's go to Domino's. Yeah, here's how I know we got fifteen dollars is because I had to save both of my. So I would I would go to two games and then I would get to play a poker tournament and then I would go to two games and I would get to play a poker tournament because there were thirty dollar poker tournaments. <laughs> Drake was playing Thursday nights at Riverside. The- like God, that is absolutely correct. Yeah, I, like, I think was just open my last year, I believe. Oh man, yeah. Drake would have. I don't know what Drake would have done. He's, I swear to God, he spent <laughs> God half his time. Drake spent eight hours sleeping, eight hours at football, and like eight hours at the casino every day. It was like it was like a trip. And, and at some at some points in my life, that's not an exaggeration whatsoever. Yeah, that's crazy. Drake has a he has a really great story about about poker and KF, but we won't get into that right now. Um, so you came from. Let me let me let me find this. You are from Bloomfield, Connecticut, Bloomfield yep. High School. Yep. How does Jason Manson, way back in two thousand and what three, two two thousand two, find yep. his way to Iowa City? What, what were the other options? Had you ever, have you ever, some of these guys that we played with had never even heard of the Iowa Hawkeyes before, especially like a couple, I, we, we played with a, a guy named Jordan Kanziri. He like had, he had a, he had a, he had an offer from Villanova and he was committed there and KF called him and offered him and he told him, nah, I'm good. <laughs> he didn't even know what like an offer from Iowa meant. So like, what was your familiarity with the program and, and how did you end up in IC? Well, funny story on that is Coach O'Keefe was recruiting our school. Okay. I, I had a teammate that came here, which helped me ultimately come here. Okay. But Jamel, Jamel Lewis was a running back here. Oh, wow. That was your teammate in high school. He was my teammate in high school. Okay. So they were recruiting him first. And by recruiting him, I had met Coach O'Keefe. Mm-hmm. And somewhere along the line, I might have been like a sophomore or junior. He comes in and he asks me, what do I know about the Hawkeyes? What's our mascot? What's Iowa's mascot? And I'm like, the Boilermakers? Oh, man. <laughs> so I'm, probably, I'm like, man, I, and I blew it. So at that point, I'm like, there's no way these dudes are going to offer me. <laughs> but I uh, came back my senior year and offered me. But at, at, after my senior year, I had uh, my four, my final four were uh, Iowa, Wisconsin, Maryland, and UConn. 
Okay. And I didn't, I only took two official visits. I went to Iowa and UConn. I didn't really pursue Wisconsin and Maryland because they wanted me more as an athlete and I wanted to play quarterback and Iowa and UConn were going to give me that opportunity. Okay. Everybody wants to be the QB, toss it around, <laughs> you know, which I and still, I to, you know, I want to prove people that I could be a yep. quarterback in college. Of course, of course. Uh, some, you know, some of us didn't have that luxury. I was basically reduced to a specialist from linebacker in high school. So that's, that was better than that I got to do. Um, I'm going to have to also, I'm going to have to toss it around. You're going to be there this weekend, right? The yes. legacy event. Okay. We're going to have to get a, we're going to have to get one of the balls out. We're going to have to throw a little long toss, see what you got in the shoulder still. Yeah, still got um, a, little, a little bit left. For sure. Yeah. Um, man, you came in and so you came in in 2002, right as the team went on that three-year run of success. Yeah. What was orange, that? Orange Bowl, Orange Bowl, right off the bat. Dude, what was that like? I mean, you walked in. We used to give the 2015 freshmen a bunch of shit because they came in. We went undefeated during the regular season, almost beat Michigan State in the, in the Big Ten title game. We did get our asses kicked by Stanford and McCaffrey in the in the Rose Bowl, but they had the easiest season of practice ever because we got a lot of light days when we were winning. Yeah, and, and like, and they didn't know what it was like to lose. They, they they had no idea. They just thought, okay, we go into each game. Here's the game plan. The guys are up on the wall. Okay, we block our guys and we make make tackles, make plays. Hey, we win the ball game. Right. And we always used to give them shit like, you guys have no idea how how actually hard it is to do what we just did yeah. and yeah, i feel like you were you were kind of part of that class like you came in and in probably a bunch of other guys i'm sure you have plenty of stories about dudes who washed out who like thought it was easy and totally didn't understand what it actually took um but you were right in that like three four year period of kf and the boys really catching momentum yeah. just 2002 2003 2004 you played with some savages too, like Greenway, S- Sanders. I mean, what Dude, were some of those guys like? Crazy. It was scary. <laughs> I, I know that you talked about about Bob and because yeah. you were on scout team. I was on the scout team, and we had another quarterback, Cy Phillips, so we both were red shirts. And you're always looking for bodies on the scout team. So me being athletic, I ended up playing some receiver on scout team. Yep, you. I know you did. And that's when I really got introduced to Bob and oh, God. Green, Greenway, Abdul Hodge, those dudes. And it was brutal. <laughs> <laughs> you had the worst job. You had the worst job on the team. It was brutal. Oh my I, goodness. I, I, you know, I thought we were, I thought we were all teammates, but during practice, they like hated us. <laughs> they, did not, they didn't care. From what I understand, Bob Sanders had no off switch. So it didn't matter if his teammates. If it was his enemies, if it was his grandma, dude, if you have a football, he's going to smoke you. You had the different colored jersey on, and no, regardless of the look you were given, he was locked in. You know what I mean? He was God. locked in. Is, and if, did you that, up, if you messed up the look, they would let they all would let you know, too. Yeah. You know what I mean? So Did, did that come with a, an anxiety? I, I know that just some of those long, hot fall practices, those came with their own anxiety by themselves, but – not only were you like strapping it up, new guy, young guy, scout team, there's some pressure, got to help the defense get the look right. But then you know that Bob is head hunting. Yeah. Did you like walk out to practice kind of hesitant sometimes? Like, ooh, I don't know if I want to be here today. <laughs> Definitely had those thoughts going through your head when you when you go through the warm-up line. Mm-hmm. Like, what am I doing? <laughs> Why am I doing this? It's like you know what you're but, signing but, up for. But at the same time, too, you wanted to prove your worth. You know what I mean? And and you yeah. knew at the at the at the you know at the end of the season or the next in the spring. By the time spring ball came around, you were gonna have a chance to potentially prove your worth. And those were just some of the lumps and the growing pains that we had to go through. So it was almost like, to me, it was like a rite of passage. You had to go through it, yeah, um, to show those guys that you good. When it's your time, you know they they believe in you mm-hmm. and, and pass the torch, so to say. So. Uh, that's, how, that's kind of how I approached it. Yep. Yeah. You, you played with uh, you played with another guy that most people know. And the reason that most people probably don't know the name Jason Manson as well is because Drew Tate made a few plays and did some crazy things as an Iowa Hawkeye. We had Drew on for episode 200 and he is, he's still 
on one. Like he's <laughs> he's a special guy, and I'm sure you. He was in town a couple weeks ago, man. Not too much has changed. I, yeah, like, what did you learn from him, and just like just being in the room with him every day, and and how was he as a teammate? Like, what can you say about Drew Tate? I think his I think his image on the field sometimes was misconstrued because he he was so I mean he was a fierce competitor mm-hmm. he hated losing and you know something he, some dudes like I, I remember somebody I can't remember which guy dropped it somebody dropped the ball hit him right in the hands and he ran down to him grabbed him by the face mask and some people like were thrown off by that and I I don't even think the kid that dropped it took offense to it but we all knew Drew like he just he was competitive mm-hmm. that was just him you know what I mean and some people, it might look like he was being a bad teammate. He didn't have to – the dude already felt bad for dropping the ball, whatever. Why are you coming at him like that? But that was Drew. You know what I mean? That was Drew. He was just fiery all the time. He demanded that respect, sounds like. Absolutely. Sounds yeah. a little bit like uh, – CJ CJ wasn't as intense. CJ Beathard, um, 15. Honestly, 16. it sounds like Josie a lot. Does sound like Josie. Josie would uh, – he was our middle linebacker, mm-hmm. and he would definitely grab people and, like, and tell him how it is. And if something had to be said, like he would say it, but he was otherwise like a quiet guy and was more of a lead by example. And when you, those are the kind of guys like you go out to practice and they just elevate everybody else. Yeah. Like no one wants to mess up because right. if right. you do, you feel like you're wasting their time. Yeah. And for sure. for sure. Yeah. And, and I understand that more than like in a, in a different way, because as a specialist, you almost always feel like that. Like as a specialist, you get, you know, you get the four minute field goal period and like the, the six reps at the end of practice when you're doing move the ball. Right. And so you, you have such this limited time and you're supposed to be perfect. So if you come in and you fuck up, then you wasted everybody's time and you don't want to do that. So I understand that to the max. Um, that's wild. Uh, Drew couldn't play one game though. He couldn't play. <laughs> and it, Jason Manson gets the call. I, I, you said, you told me a little bit about this and we talked just a tad bit in between, like, you know, like I think at like hole nine when we were playing at Wakanda, uh, take me through you getting, you getting the nod drew sick or whatever happened. And you guys got Syracuse in the dome. What, 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 what's going through Jason's head at that point? I don't know. Nerves all over the place. I, I actually had like, 40 friends and family there. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah, because it was out east. It was in Syracuse, and it was like a four-hour ride from Connecticut. And uh, and this is 2006, so right the year after. My, uh, senior, my yep. senior year. Yep. And um, it was, it was, I don't know, just overthinking too many things. Like, yeah. finally got an opportunity, excited for that opportunity. Nervous at the same time, trying to play perfect, don't want to mess up, that, that type of vibe. That's kind of what my vibe was at the time. Mm-hmm. And um, at the, they also launched a movie that day. It was the launching of uh, The Express. So they had the cast of that movie, uh, Dennis Quaid and some others about Ernie Banks. The movie mm-hmm. about Ernie Banks. So that was their one of their most prominent players in their history. And... Um, it was a live that like that dome was loud. I remember that the dome was mm-hmm. loud and it wasn't full by any means, but it was loud as heck. I found this yeah. picture right here. I'm going to share it for those on the, on the YouTube. Look at him. Somebody he, he's got his hand on you. You're trying to get away. That was one of my better plays. I think I took off for a first down. Okay. On that one, okay. If I remember correct. All right. But, uh, but no, man, I, 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 th- I, I don't know. I, the first play I remember I, I damn near tripped getting out of the up from under center. Mm-hmm. Uh, Heart rate probably at sky high. On me, but but I completed the pass. First play, nine yard game. So I don't know. You know, after a while, it kind of felt like riding a bike, and there was some there was some turnovers in there that few interceptions, huh? At the time, I took credit for, and then now <laughs> I blame. He told he told me one of them was on Moyaki. Yeah, man, right through his hand. Right through his hands. That's okay. That's okay. You, <laughs> you you essentially set up the, I mean, probably the biggest defensive stand, the most notable defensive stand in Iowa history. No, they they rocked out that seven play drive. Seven well, play. And what that was, was it? Too, what was it? Drive. I was just gonna say, what was it like watching that from the sideline? 
it was intense. It was intense. You know what I mean? Taking a knee, saying prayers. Oh, but, man. But, but uh, I, I also that day, too, I want to say uh, the linebacker, Mike, Mike Klinkenberg, I want to mm-hmm. say he lost his dad that day or the day before or something like that. So he, oh, wow. He played lights out. Um, and he was a young guy, I think, too, at that time. Yeah, he would have been. Might have been like a sophomore or something stepping up in there. But, uh, no, nah, it was awesome. Now, I, my, what I do remember that whole game, um, even though I felt like crap, nobody really – Doubted me. It felt like I felt like I had the team support. You know what I mean. The That's defense, awesome. the defense would come up to me, tap me on the head. The offense never, never wavered. So from that whole experience, um, I felt good about that. Had to feel good to like get one game too, right? Like, obviously, Drew had a great career. He's one of Iowa's legends, and you happen to be the guy that was in the shadow of that. But to get one start. And to like feel that for one day, like that's pretty validating, especially when, as you just mentioned, the team respects you and gives you that like, hey, you're our guy today. Yeah. It don't matter. For sure. And that's that probably felt really good. Definitely felt good. And, and then it was in front of a lot of my friends and family. Right. Got to see it. You know, what I mean, I wish I had a better performance, but sure. Nonetheless, they went to the game and got to see me play. Mm-hmm. So after four years of not seeing me play they they were able to see me play and we got the win i'm undefeated yeah. as a starting quarterback <laughs> that's awesome it says here that you are also part of the uh the old isac committee yeah I back did in ISAC. college yep. I did yeah we i our roommate was uh was our like isac representative for the for the so you were like you were like uh man it, you were the recipient of the big 10 sportsmanship award in 2006 Yep. Man, you did some stuff. Yeah, man. But looking back at it, like I don't, I, ne- I didn't take advantage of it. Like being on the ISAC board, mm-hmm. I had a, a, a voice. I could have been more vocal yep. about various different topics and things like that. Sure. And now as an adult looking back at it, you know, I definitely could have did a lot more with it. Yeah. Um, Big congrats to you on winning the sportsmanship award. Cause I would have been near the bottom for that voting. Yeah. Um, so good on you. Appreciate it. <laughs> Man, I don't know how that gets handed out, but Drake and I weren't on that list. We weren't <laughs> we were not even close. Uh, I'm, I'm really curious because you said once you got into coaching, the whole idea was to come back. And then 2018, whatever job, you know, you're back in Iowa City applying for whatever job that is. And then 2020 last year happens. And – Obviously, the stuff that happened just in society in Minneapolis, but obviously Iowa football as well. Um, black players start to come out and talk about coaches, experiences, people from teammates from your time. I'm sure you had a ton of conversations. And you had this idea of coming back and working for the program for over a decade at this point. And here you are a year removed from all that happening with the spot in the program as a black man yourself, that had to be, that had to be pretty crazy to kind of go through and watch happen because I don't think anybody would have, anybody would have blamed you. I'm sure you had a lot of questions of, okay, do I want to come back and work for this program? Have things changed since I've been there and for you to uproot your whole family and career to come back a year later and work for the program that just went through what it went through. It says a lot about you and your faith in coach Ferentz and everybody that's still in the program. Um, Talk about your mindset kind of when all that went down and how that affected you, if at all, in trying to come back and work for Iowa. Yeah, no, it was, it was, it was tough. It was tough to watch. You know what I mean? Cause I'm like, I'm all, I've always been proud about the program mm-hmm. and, and not, like I said, I didn't have on the outside, you know, people didn't think I had a great career, college career or whatever, right. but I never got, yeah, yeah I, I, you know, I never, me going through the program, I didn't have a bad experience. Mm-hmm. I had a good experience other than the playing time, you know right. what I mean? And, you know, that's what happens when you play quarterback. At any on any team, you know, typically there's only one guy that's going to be the guy. 
and I happen not to be that guy. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't mean that my experience was bad. I still, I, I wasn't treated bad. I wasn't one of the guys that got treated bad. So I wanted, once, once all that stuff came out, the initial part was like, man, what's happening? What are these guys talking about? Some of the things I can, I can probably say, and I've seen it happen to some people. Mm-hmm. Some people definitely were targeted and, and, and got the brunt of some situations, mm-hmm. but that wasn't me. And I always felt like I was a glue guy. I was, I was, I was friends with everybody on the team, yep. walk-ons, white guys, black guys, whoever the case was. I had everybody, I felt like I had respect for everybody and everybody gave me that respect back. So when the job came up, I felt like I could come in and, and have an impact yeah. and, and, and keep the glue, keep the team together and, and keep achieving great stuff. So that was part of, part of, part of my reason to be, come back to through, through all that. Yeah. That's, that's I'm really, not- that's really interesting to hear as a glue guy is a, is a term that you hear a lot in you know, for those guys that are role players, a lot of the, a lot of the scout team guys, but to then flip that 15 years later and be a glue guy on the staff to kind of come in and help with a situation that just happened. That's really interesting. So you, you actually felt more called to, to be back. Like, does it feel like everything kind of happened for a reason for you almost? It kind of does feel that way. It kind of does feel that way. But even through my coaching career, I think that um, I, I, I relate well with players. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I feel like I, I would agree with coach. that. I would agree with that at, at the golf course. I had, I, sorry, but I had never heard your name before until you were hired for this position. And then obviously I did my homework and then all of a sudden you show up at Wakanda and you're in my group, in my golf group. And I feel like two or three holes in, like, you know, we're chilling, having a good time. Yeah. Felt like I knew you for a long time. Right. And so that's definitely not attributed to me. It's attributed to you because it doesn't always happen that way with me. I'm a quiet guy. I don't like to, to really mingle, but you, you make it easy and you, you do feel like it's just, it just comes naturally a little bit. So, so that's Jason, good on you. I appreciate it. Good on you for, uh, for making friends with Kluver because Kluver <laughs> was the guy that sat in his room and played Minecraft when we had crawfish boils in our driveway. So he's a really hard guy to even like at all, even a little bit. So really good on you. That's true. Uh, speaking yeah, I, of speaking of the crawfish boil, Kevin has now entered the chat as well. Kev, how you doing? Hey, what's going on, boys? Have you uh, have you gotten a chance to meet Jason yet, or is this your first time as well? I haven't. Jason, what's going on, man? How you doing, Kev? Good to meet you, man. Can you guys believe? Too. Welcome back to the Hawkeye fam. Appreciate it. Appreciate yeah, you, y'all having me on. Can you guys believe that uh, the first thing that Jason said to me was, hey, you're the guy that does washed up walk-ons? Like he's listened to the podcast. Yeah, like, I've listened to it. And he he reached out. He's the one who wanted to see if we could dig up film of the uh, of the combat drill. Oh God! Oh God! Did I'm you ever hard. run combat drill? I don't know. That's why I wanted to see it. Okay. Oh shit! I'll explain it for well, you. Well, you got access in the building, man. You'd have better chance of finding it than we would. Yeah. Where's your office at? It looks a little bare on the wall. You gotta, you gotta yeah, get I, some. I got, stuff. No, I got nothing in here, man. I'm still real. I'm, when the wife comes, I'm gonna have her help me set it up and make okay. it look all nice. That's good. I don't yeah. have no, I, these guys got man. They got. I didn't. I don't. I don't have my helmet. These guys got to keep helmets and all that type of that's, stuff. That's that's crazy. I, you gotta go on. back. You gotta retroactively go back and get just steal a helmet from Greg's office down there. I'm scared of Greg. I, I can't fuck with Greg. I might get yelled You're at. You're still scared of Greg too, dude? Still scared of him, man. <laughs> we So, Jason, this is – when we were there, we used to call them uh, these, like, this fantasy currency, like, fake currency. It's like kind of like Dogecoin, except for it was Greg tokens. Greg tokens could actually be one of the cryptocurrencies, and I, all the Iowa players could be sponsored by it. Um, and, like, it was this, it was this like, fake – brownie points essentially that you that every single guy had with greg and the more greg tokens you had the better chance you had of going up to the window and say yo greg can i get a let me get a pair of socks and yeah. and for some people he'd be like cool yeah what what size do you want he'd throw you a pair of socks for other people you had to like do the laundry for three hours before he'd even like maybe consider giving you a new shoelace you know and you got like it's like 
cut a hole in him just so he believes that something is wrong. I, I don't know. <laughs> Jump through all different types of hoops to, to get anything. Yeah, that's funny though. I just it sucks that you didn't get your helmet. You gotta you gotta have a helmet in there, man. You got a jersey, I, right? I got a mini. I got a mini helmet. Did you have your jersey? I do. I have the I have the frame jersey. Okay. I got that. Uh, I got the I got the throwback jersey. So we played oh. Kent State. I think there was 05 in Kent State, but I didn't get to wear it in the game because I had right a foot in my foot at that time. So I missed the I missed the opportunity to wear it live. Mm-hmm. But when you guys wore those jerseys, those blacks and grays against Ohio State, I was shocked. <laughs> I was jealous. I was shocked. Those jerseys were fine. They they that was I've got that jersey and, down in and the whooped their ass. So it was like icing on the cake. It was. It really was. It, it, there's really no. Yeah, better. you got you got to ball out when you get the ultimate unis. Otherwise, you don't get to wear them anymore. Exactly. Yeah. I, and when, here's when the thing: did we that, ever lose? To keep keep swagging up. Did we ever lose in an alternate uniform? Well, we won in in fifteen against Minnesota. Minnesota. Sixteen, we wore. Did we wear one in sixteen? No, but he no, cha- he changed Minnesota our cleats. Remember when he we had those yellow cleats and we started playing bad? And he's like, "Fuck these yellow cleats!" Yeah, we had we, we we had cleats that were like different colors, and we lost like who did we lose? Like North Dakota State or something? And they're like, "Fuck this! We're going back to the other cleats." <laughs> okay. <laughs> takes a little bit to get KF to, to, to change on the aesthetic. He loves that old school Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh Steeler yeah. look. Loves I thought it. the, I thought oh, the black pants with the yellow stripe was also a good, a good look. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but a, it don't matter what, what we do with our uniforms. We're going to be wearing those pro style socks till KF's in the grave, man. <laughs> you know, La- Kev, last time we had a, we took questions for the podcast. Somebody asked why, do we wear the pro style socks? Like, why can't we wear something that looks a little better? And I don't have an answer for that other than KF. Actually, KF had a really good story for that, that I probably am not going to tell on the podcast, but he, <laughs> but he, it, he just wants to wear those socks. And that's the one thing that he just doesn't going to budge on. So for everybody, <laughs> he'll die on that hill for sure. Yeah. hundred um, percent. Jason, you played all the way through your five years. Did you ever, have the thoughts of like, you know, Drew was Drew the same class as you then? He actually came in the year after me. After and then ended up not graduating the same year. Right. Right. Because he, he didn't take he didn't the red shirt. Red shirt. When that happened, year two, year three, and you kind of you know, he gets this the playing time. Was there ever the thought of maybe I can go find, you know, maybe I'll hit up Yukon or maybe I'll hit up Maryland? Like Maybe they still want me. I could go try and play, get playing time there. Or like what kept you in Iowa City? Cause that's a tough road to to you know, I don't know if you guys got it back then, but we got the Iron Hawk if you made it through your your five years, like your last strength conditioning workout in the summer going into your senior year. Coach Doyle handed everybody an Iron Hawk, like, hey, you made it through the program. And there are not many people who do that. We graduated with 14 guys uh who who, who made it day one. To, to the last day mm-hmm. and um i'm sure it was similar for your class as well the attrition is crazy it's just the way it is in college football um what was the biggest contributing factor to you like sticking it out and saying hey i'm gonna be black and gold till the end here um i, I think it was i had a couple conversations one with my, my dad and, and my mom and my grandfather and at the end of it, I, I, I think that I just, it was when I signed to come to <laughs> Iowa, that's what I signed up for. Yep. Like, yep. I'm going to see it through, you know, and that, that, and that see it through was a thing that I was in a program in eighth grade called Man on a Mission. It's like a little leadership group. Mm-hmm. And that was a poem that we had to recite, see it through. And I, and I, I, I told myself, I'm, I'm going to see it through. You know what I mean? I signed up for it. I'm not going to quit. I felt like transferring would have been the easy way out. And even when you transfer, there's no guarantees. The grass isn't always greener. Yeah. So I would have had to start over again as a junior or a redshirt junior or whatever, somewhere else. And there's no guarantees. So I was always a play away. That's how I looked at it. I could have been, I could have been the guy if something happened at any moment. Yep. And you were for one day. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. 
I that is obviously in today's age with the transfer rule and that's crazy. That's, that that doesn't exist anymore. Nobody probably thinks like that anymore. That that mindset is few and far between. Yeah. But uh, I, I could probably speak for the other two guys on the podcast and Hawkeye Nation in saying that having a guy like you in the player development role, working with our young guys at Iowa in the program that we all care about so much having a guy like you that had that mindset then stuck as a Hawkeye and he still bleeds black and gold and now comes all the way back around. I don't know if there's anybody else better to do it, man. I really don't like, I'm happy to have and we you. need, we really need you to install that mindset instill that mindset in these kids because That's what I'm saying the Hawks have had some serious recruiting classes lately. And if these dudes can just adopt the mindset that you got, that they're going to work their fucking balls off and see it through, we can have a damn good squad. Yeah, definitely. I, I hope to be that voice, man, and just to be able to give kids perspective it, because it's hard now with the social media stuff, for yep. sure. But turning off the noise from back home, mm-hmm. wherever, they, wherever they're coming from, they were the guy, and wherever they're coming from, they have people that they listen to. And even I, I went through it, you know what I mean? People talking about you're the hero. Race, race, race. They chose him because he, he, you're black, and, 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 and it wasn't that, man. And at the, as I got older, I can look at the facts. You know what I mean? The facts was I feel like Drew made better – he made quicker decisions than I did. He was he – got, he got rid of the ball. You know what I mean? And, and I always played trying to be perfect. Mm-hmm. And he just played free. You know what I'm saying? And I think that was the huge – the biggest difference that – People don't understand that from the outside, though. If you're in it and live it every day, then it's, you can live with that decision. And that's what I did. You know what I mean? I tried to cut the noise off and didn't listen to the, the stuff that really didn't matter or didn't weigh in on that decision. People didn't know the insides of it. So yeah. I, had to, I had to make some tough decisions. Now, the other thing I could have did was I could have switched positions. They asked, me to, they asked me to do some things. They didn't ask me to switch immediately. They asked me to do some different things, line up in here, do some stuff that would have got me some chances. And I turned it down. Mm -hmm. I turned it down. I didn't have faith in what they wanted to do because my pride was telling me it was a way for them to get me out because I, at that point I was listening to some of that stuff, some of that noise, but had I done it like growing up, I'm a Cowboys fan. My favorite player was Michael Irvin. I wanted to be a wide receiver. Why wouldn't I transition to that? at some point in my career, if it was going to allow me to be on the field more. Right. Pride, pride got in the way, man. I, uh, Chick was an awesome dude when he was our, when he was our director of player development, obviously broad was incredible. And, uh, and is now in a, a new role, taking his talents and his perspective and everything. And now with you in there, um, I, like I said, I really don't think we could get better guys. So I'm, I'm extremely happy that, uh, clearly KF sees all this as well. And it's a good thing. I don't make the decisions. KF makes the decisions and, and he's pretty good at making decisions. So um, mm-hmm. we're, we're glad to have you, Jason. And we're especially happy that you took the time to come on the podcast with us, man. I appreciate you having me, man. I'm excited to be back. Hopefully I can have an impact on the program. And I, I, I always think that we're not far off. <laughs> you know what I mean? We win the big 10 and we got a shot for that playoff and, national championship and hopefully we can get to that we love that okay hey, that's a big hug for us when you see him <laughs> yeah I, yeah he just hugs kf this is from the washed up walk <laughs> we'll do i'm gonna do it <laughs> oh please don't um you and, you and i could do it this weekend I, I i'm excited to see you again this weekend and see a bunch of the other guys as well so and kevin will be there too right kev yep plan on it man good awesome right. good to meet you guys well, we'll let you go. Maybe you can uh, decorate that office a little bit more or figure yeah. out the, I'm sure you got like 35 freshmen who are trying to figure out where their campus buildings are still. So you probably got some text to answer after this hour with us. Um, episode 232 with Jason Manson. Uh, thank you guys for listening. We will be back again on Monday. Peace. Appreciate you guys.